Good morning. Um, I'm speaking to you from the what's called the sacristy, the small vestry where the clergy keep their robes, where we keep the chalices and everything for worship and so forth. Um, and as you may see, particularly if I lean back and the light changes, um, we had a break in last night. I'll just uh, do that and you can probably see it. Um, and the kind of frustrating thing is that I almost caught the guy who was responsible because I heard noise from my back door, thought nothing much of it immediately, then breaking glass and I assumed it was somebody smashing a beer bottle or vandalism, but then I thought maybe it was somebody trying to break into the scout den. So I came round rather cautiously with um, a camera at the ready and armed with my stout pilgrim stick only to see a tallish young man kind of slip away through the shadows well I didn't know what he might have done so I so I just sort of quickened my pace hoping to meet him and um, but by the time I got to the car park he was furiously cycling out the gate and up the road on a bicycle with no lights um, and the police have been and he'd uh, managed to steal some money that was foolishly of course on the table um, in front of the window but of course the repairing the damage will cost far more than that but also it is quite annoying and um, I felt quite shocked and quite, quite affronted um, at the damage and, and the outrage as it were um, and it came at the end of the day when I felt quite tired and I don't know, locked down weary and and pretty low anyway. So, you know, it wasn't a great day and a great finish to it. Um, but that reminds me that whenever we read the Bible, we bring to it whatever our circumstances are at that time. So it's maybe just a good exercise to do today's Bible reflection here at the scene of the crime, as it were. So the Bible passage that was set for today um, is from St Luke's Gospel um, and I'll read it to you. I'm going to then read a short reflection that is written in this rather excellent book, Reflections for Daily Prayer, that we use here in church each morning, which happens to be on this same passage today. And um, But then I'll also perhaps apply my own thoughts arising from this uh, incident. From Luke 7. After Jesus had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. A centurion there had a slave whom he valued highly and who was ill and close to death. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and heal his slave. When they came to Jesus, they appealed to him earnestly, saying, He is worthy of having you do this for him, for he loves our people, and it is he who built our synagogue for us. And Jesus went with them. But when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore I did not presume to come to you. But only speak the word and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this, and the slave does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, he said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. When those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Now I'm going to read so just a short reflection which is provided for us by Christopher Herbert, who was formerly bishop of somewhere, I think, now retired, I believe. Um... Uh, Bishop, he's, he's actually he, he retired as Bishop of St Alban, Al, Al, Albans in 2009 um, he writes ah the subtle social, political and cultural nuances in this story a man of significant powerful authority appealing for help for his dying slave a Gentile seeking help from a Jew the enrolment by the centurion of Jewish interlocutors to act on his behalf. 
Note that the centurion and Jesus do not meet. There is no direct conversation between the two of them. And in spite of Jesus neither going near the slave nor meeting the centurion, the slave is healed. It's all very curious. It's a story of missing encounters, which is nevertheless filled to overflowing with implicit promises about the future, when Gentiles, that's non-Jews, will receive the good news, when slaves will be freed, when death itself will be conquered, and when the authority of Jesus Christ will be recognised for what it is, God breaking into time to redeem and heal all that is. As soon as we analyse the story like that, we can see the hand of Luke, the author of this gospel, as a very skilful literary editor. He is doing two things. First, he is both revealing but also hiding within this delightfully crafted story one of the underlying themes of his gospel, that Jesus' mission was not for the Jews only, but for the entire world. Second, by playing with the idea of missing encounters, he is exploring the paradox that out of apparent absence, the presence of God is made known. Well, I quite like that. It's interesting. I mean, I thought and realised before how the healing of the centurion slave is significant. Um, the centurion being an outsider who normally in the Roman Empire at that time um, to a particularly unpleasant and unwelcome posting that was Palestine in that time, would have relied entirely on violence, coercion, threat and corruption, whereas this is a good man. And so the implication here is that, yeah, the gospel reaches to all people, all levels of society, the slave and the centurion equally. But that idea of absence, yeah, I like that. That perhaps there are times when that Jesus, that the, the, the spark of Jesus's grace can, can cross that gap. So that when we, for instance, feel that God is absent, indeed, perhaps truly, he is closer than we can understand. And equally, he can cross that gap, a spark of grace can cross that gap, so that when we think about and appreciate people who are not Christians, don't confess any Christian faith, well, they too can be covered by that extraordinary capacity of grace to leap the gap, as it did for the centurion, who never became a Christian, presumably, but clearly is commended by Jesus in a way that he does to no other in the Gospels. But then returning to our little episode of last night and this morning, and I'm left feeling, yeah, cross, a bit hurt, a bit shocked, annoyed, on my behalf, on behalf of the church that I love so much, um, and you, the community, because between us, we have to sort it all out. And yet, I think to myself, ordinarily, our doors literally are wide open, and metaphorically, they always are, and still are now, are wide open for him, for anybody, to come in and access this grace, which is shown in Jesus Christ for all people, for slave and centurion, for Jew and non-Jew and whatever nationality, for rich and for poor, for young and for old, for those in trouble and those for whom life is going well. This extraordinary treasure of grace is here symbolised and available. And he, any person, has only to literally or metaphorically walk through the open door and encounter grace and mercy and peace, as well as, I hope, friendship and fellowship and a community of, of, of honesty, integrity and welcome and understanding. And yet he has chosen instead to take a big rock from the shrubbery and well, cave in the window in order to access a paltry 50 quid or something. So, although I'm annoyed, and I kind of almost wish I could have stuck my pilgrim stick through the spokes of his wheels, yet really, of course, 
I know that we are the lucky ones and that poor guy, the unfortunate one, for whatever reasons he's done what he's done, but he's put off that time when he can realise that he doesn't need to break into a church through the window. He can access through scripture, through grace, through prayer, even through the building itself. He can access something of infinitely greater worth. <laughs> so Lord God, we pray your blessing upon us as a church. Help us to realise what treasures you have given to us and shared with us. And be with all those who are desperate or deluded and who seek their good in ways that can never satisfy. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.